we're going to read from two portions of God's word today. Our first reading is taken from Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, and we're going to read verses 1 to 10. A passage in, in which Paul speaks about the death that, that we all are under in our nature, that we're experiencing in, in our character, that Christ, only Christ can free us from through, through faith in him. Ephesians chapter 2, and we read from verse 1. You were dead in the trespasses and sins in which you once walked, following the course of this world, following the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work in the sons of disobedience, among whom we all once lived in the passions of our flesh, carrying out the desires of the body and the mind, and were by nature children of wrath like the rest of mankind. But God, being rich in mercy, because of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace in kindness towards us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of works so that no one may boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand that we should walk in them. Then we're going to turn over to Genesis chapter 3 and read the whole of this chapter. Paul was writing about the death that we all experience that is inherent in our character, in our nature, death that we're, we are freed from through faith in Christ. Where has this death come from? Why is, is this death, why, how has death invaded God's perfect world? Well, we read of the invasion of death into God's perfect world. In Genesis chapter 3, we take up our reading in verse 1. Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God actually say, You shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the spirit, We may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened. And you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, and that it was a delight to the eyes, and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her, and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. The man and his wife hid themselves from the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid, because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, The woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me fruit of the tree, and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. 
to the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband, and he shall rule over you. And to Adam he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. For the sweat of your face you shall eat bread, till you return to the ground, for out of it you were taken. For you are dust, and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve, because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skin and clothed them. Then the Lord God said, Behold, the man has become like one of us in knowing good and evil. Now lest he reach out his hand and take also of the tree of life and eat and live forever. Therefore the Lord God sent him out from the garden of Eden to work the ground from which he was taken. He drove out the man. And at the east of the Garden of Eden, he placed a cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. Amen. We end our reading there, the end of that chapter, and we pray that God would bless this reading of his holy and fallible word to our hearts and to our souls. Please keep that little passage open in front of you as we come to to study it, particularly verses 7 to 24, for a short while today. Why is there death and suffering in the world? If God is perfect, if God is good and and loving, if God is the God of love that he proclaims himself to be in the Bible, why is there death and suffering in the world? If God created the world perfect, uh, as we read of him doing in Genesis 1 and 2, why is there death and suffering in the world? I'm sure you've heard questions like these. You've maybe even been asked questions like these. You've maybe even asked questions like these yourself. Why do people die? Why? Oh, why? Why? Is there death and suffering in the world? If God is perfect and good and loving, how come this world is so far from perfect, so far from good, full of of so much pain and hurt and agony? We find the answer to these questions here in the passage that we read just a short while ago in Genesis chapter 3. Death, friends, is the fatal consequence of, of the fall, mankind's fall into sin through Adam and Eve's disobedience against God and eating the forbidden fruit that we looked at last time. Having created a, a wonderful, perfect world and placed two perfect people in a perfect garden where their every need was met in a superabundance of, of pleasurable provision, God put one, one simple limitation on man and woman. In Genesis 2, verse 16 and 17, he said, you may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. If they obeyed the God who had created them, they would continue in their perfect existence. But if they disobeyed, God said, the consequence would be death. And in our last study a few weeks ago, we saw how Adam and Eve, prompted by the, the, by the devil, disobeyed God. They ate the forbidden fruit. And today we see them, they ex- them experience the consequence of their disobedience. The punishment that God warned them they would experience if they were foolish enough to disobey him. Death. 
death. Now maybe you're sitting there and you're thinking to yourself, but we don't really see Adam and Eve die here in Genesis 3. They didn't die the day they ate the forbidden fruit. Yes, God tells them in chapter nine, or verse 19, they're going to die. They're going to return to the, the ground out of which they were taken. He says, you are dust, and to dust you shall return. But they don't actually die in this chapter. They don't experience the consequence in themselves of, of their sin that God had warned them about. Yes, they may begin to die. That aging process, the, the process by which our bodies age and, and deteriorate, deteriorate and, uh, and, 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 and erode away, that may begin in Adam and Eve in this chapter. But they don't actually experience the, the death that, that God promised them as his punishment and sin. And it's not until chapter 4, maybe you're thinking that, that, we, that when Cain murders Abel, we see the fatal consequence of sin in all its horror. But we do, we do witness Adam and Eve's death here in this passage. We do see the introduction of death into the world in chapter 3. Because friends, whenever God laid down death as his punishment for sin, you know, Physical death, our hearts stopping beating, our pulses stopping, and, and our souls being separated from our bodies. Physical death is not the, the only aspect, the only component of the death that God laid down as punishment for sin. There's much, much more to death than just physical death. And here in Genesis 3, we see four different components of death in addition to physical death. Four different ways that, that mankind died on that terrible day and we continue to die today. Death in all its horrible fullness is unfolded for us here in Genesis 3. We're going to look at these four components of, of death today. The first of these components, the first way that mankind died, the first facet of, of death, the death that God laid down as punishment for sin that we see in this chapter, is a change in our character. A change, a wholesale change in our character. The first way mankind, mankind died was in our nature. Verse 5 uh, Satan told Adam and Eve, if they ate the forbidden fruit, their eyes would be opened and they would be like God. He says, you'll be like God, knowing good and evil. And that was true. Partially. We read in verse 7, when they ate the, the, the fruit, what do we read in verse 7? The eyes of both were opened. But not in the way they thought they'd be. Yes, they were like God in knowing good and evil, but they didn't know good and evil in the way God knew it. They knew it in a totally different way from God. God knows good and evil from the, the position of, of loving good and, and hating evil, always doing good, never once doing evil. But Adam and Eve come to know good and evil in a completely different way. They now know evil from having chosen it, from having done it, experiencing in themselves the consequences of having done it. And the consequences of having done evil was a complete change in their character, their nature. The death of their perfect sinless character and the emergence of an imperfect, defiled, dead one. We see this change of nature immediately in, in chapter 3. In verse 25 of chapter 2, we're told that, that Adam and Eve, as they, they resided in that garden of paradise, they were both naked and were not ashamed. And th their nakedness, their absence of, of any shame at their nakedness, it is a picture for us of their complete innocence, their purity, their openness. There was nothing, not one thing about them, about their nature, about what they'd done, that gave them cause for any guilt or shame in any way. No sense of, of guilt or shame. Complete innocence. That's what's represented in that little phrase. They were, they were naked and, and were not ashamed. 
But now in verse 7, having eaten the forbidden fruit, disobeyed God, what do we read in verse 7? The eyes of both were opened and they knew they were naked. Their eyes were opened and they knew they were naked. Their innocence was lost. That's what verse 7 is saying. They knew straight away that what they'd done was wrong. They'd done something wrong. They knew for the, the very first time the sting of a guilty conscience, the shame of having done something wrong. They knew in their minds they'd been made by God, for God, to honor God, to obey God. And having disobeyed God, they had an overwhelming sense of shame. They knew they were in trouble. They disobeyed God, so they were under his wrath. And for the first time, they felt fear. Fear of God's punishment. Their peace of mind was shattered forever, eternally. Replaced with anxiety and fear and worry and apprehension and shame and guilt and doubt. Their nature was changed completely. Their perfect, innocent, sinless, shameless, unworried human nature died in an instant and was replaced with a guilty, imperfect, sinful, ashamed, troubled, fearful, worried, anxious nature under the wrath of God. And friends, everyone born ever since has been born with that fallen, sinful, dead human nature that has been passed down from us, from our first parents. A nature that knows good and evil, not in the way that God knows good and evil. Loving good and hating evil. But knowing good and evil as fallen, sinful creatures who hate good and love evil. And who because of that are under the wrath of God. In their shame. And their, their guilt. An awareness of their guilt. Adam and Eve tried to cover themselves. We're told. They sewed fig leaves together. To cover themselves from each other. And from God. To cover their embarrassment. To cover their guilt. To cover their shame. And we continue to do the, the same today. Humans continue to do the same today. We try to cover our sinful character, our sinful actions, our guilt, our embarrassment, our shame from God. Now, we don't use fig leaves. We use all sorts of, of, of different things to cover our guilt and our shame from God. We use religion. Many people use religion to cover their shame and their guilt from God. Being good, being a nice person, being a good neighbor, being good living as it's termed, going to church. Mankind use a whole litany of things to try and cover our guilt and our shame from the eyes of Almighty God. But as Adam and Eve found out, all our efforts to, to hide our guilt, to cover up our guilt are useless. There's only one thing that can cover the, the guilt and shame of our sinful nature and our sinful actions. And that's the covering that's been provided for us by God. The atoning blood and the imputed righteousness of the Savior Jesus Christ. That's the first way mankind, man, mankind died. The first facet of the death that God laid down as a punishment for sin. It's the death of man's Sinless nature. Complete change in our character. The second component of, of death, the, the, this punishment that God has laid down for sin, the second way that, that mankind died in this chapter is in our relationship with God. We are cut off from our creator. That's our second point. We're cut off from our creator. We have a change in our character and we're cut off from our creator. The moment that Adam and Eve Sin, their relationship with God, it changed completely. Their sin cut them off. It, it separated them. It, it severed them from God. 
The, re the relationship they had with God up until that point was, was perfect in every way. It was a, a, a relationship of perfect love, perfect intimacy, perfect closeness and, and, and oneness and unity. They, they delighted in God. They enjoyed God. They heard his voice. They heard him walking in the garden, the sound of him and moving through the, the plants and the, and the shrubbery. And they ran to him in joy. You know, think of your best friend. And that the relationship you have with your best friend, they were closer than the best of friends. They walked together. They talked together. They shared everything together, hid nothing from each other. There wasn't an ounce of fear in their relationship. There was nothing between them that, that could have caused them any fear. Perfect relationship. A perfect relationship they'd been created to find their fullest fulfillment in, their deepest satisfaction and they did but the moment they change the moment they sinned all of that changed and their sin separated them from God when they hear God in the garden what do they do they hide from him in verse 10, whenever God asked where they'd been, Adam says, oh, I, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. Knowing they had done wrong, knowing they had sinned, knowing that God would be angry at their sin and would punish them as he had warned, knowing they now stood under his holy and just punishment, they were afraid. And they ran away and they hid themselves from him. They couldn't be in the holy presence of a holy God. His presence now brought them fear, not joy. It brought them punishment, not pleasure. It brought death, not life. Their sin ruined their perfect relationship with God. Because of their sin, they were filled with fear of God. Instead of joy and delight, their sin cut them off from God. And this aspect of, of the death that sin brought into the world is emphasized further in verses 24 to 26. Unable to have them in his holy presence because of their sin, what does God do? He drives them out of the garden. He banishes them from his presence and he places an angel with a flaming sword to, in blocking them from returning to his presence to ensure they can't return. Sin separates them from God. He cannot have them in his presence. It cut them off from him. It killed that relationship with God that they were created to find their, their deepest satisfaction, their fullest fulfillment in. And friends, the death that Adam and Eve experienced whenever they sinned is the death that, that we are all under today because we have inherited Adam and Eve's sinful nature and we all sin, so we're all cut off from God. As sinners, God cannot have us in his presence. In fact, as sinners, we don't want to be in his presence. The thought of, of being in his presence, the, the presence of a holy and a righteous God fills us with fear. Instead of enjoying God and desiring God and loving God, we have a fear of God. We have, we have a, a hatred of God. We have an animosity towards God. The relationship that man once had with God, it is dead. Dead. But this death, the death of our relationship with God is but a partial death while we're alive. While we're alive, we still enjoy something of relationship with God. Yes, it's an estranged relationship. It's a strained relationship, but it's still a relationship nonetheless. And a relationship in which, despite our sin, despite our rebellion, despite our, our animosity towards God, that God graciously shows us love and kindness and mercy and grace in all sorts of ways. 
but it's just for our lifetime. The partial separation from God that we experience during our lives becomes total separation whenever we die. Partial estrangement becomes total separation when we die. Eternal banishment from God's presence with no way back. In the same way that Adam and Eve were banished from the Garden of Eden with no way back. Total separation from God. Banishment from God's presence without any relationship with God whatsoever. Cut off completely, eternally irreversibly from his goodness, from his love and his mercy, experiencing nothing but his wrath at our sin. Separation the Bible calls hell. That's the separation from God awaiting us when we die because of our sin. Friends, sin separates us from God. It brought death. It killed our relationship with him. The second way that mankind died, the second facet of of the death that God laid down as a punishment for sin is the death of man's relationship with God. We're cut off from our creator. Death involves a change in our character We're cut off from our creator. The third component of death that we see here, the third aspect of our death that's opened up and revealed in all its horror here in in this passage is in our relationship with others. Our relationship with others. We see here that death involves contention with our companions. Contention with our companions. The peace and the unity, the companionship, the love, the relationship that man enjoyed with one another That died when sin entered the world. As I mentioned earlier, at the end of chapter 2, we read that Adam and Eve were both naked and were not ashamed. And that symbolized not only their perfection, not only their innocence, but it also symbolized the wonderful unity of the relationship they enjoyed. It was a relationship in which they hid nothing from each other. They were naked. They were completely open with each other. There was nothing between them. It was a relationship of complete openness, complete trust, a a relationship of perfect unity and oneness. Adam was a perfect husband, the perfect loving leader. He always thinking of what was best for his wife, for Eve, thinking of her needs, her wants, what she would enjoy, what she would need. Always putting his wife before himself. Eve was the perfect wife, the perfect completing companion, always supporting her husband, always, always helping, always thinking of him, thinking of his needs and and his happiness. That's the relationship they enjoy. Look at verse 12. Look down with me at verse 12. When Adam and Eve come out of hiding, They stand before God and God asks Adam, have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? What does Adam say? What does he do? Well, what he does, friends, aren't the actions of a loving husband, a loving leader. He turns to Eve and he points his finger at her and he says to God, it was her fault. She did it. She gave me the fruit. It was this woman who you gave to be with me. Instead of protecting his wife, instead of taking responsibility as a leader in an act of selfishness, downright selfishness and cowardice, what does he do? He throws his wife under the bus. It was her. She made me do it. And gone is the loving leader the loving husband, to be replaced with a selfish brute of a man whose only concern is himself and his self-preservation before God. Can you imagine the pain in Eve's heart? The hurt, the disappointment, the betrayal. 
you know, those of you just after you got married, that the first argument you had, the first cross word from your husband, uh, the, the first cross word from your wife, and you experience that stab in, in your heart, the, the, the breach in your relationship. Here's the very first cross word, the very first betrayal. Can you imagine how deeply it cut into Eve's heart the words of her dear husband? Has he betrayed her? And can you imagine the, the self-loathing in Adam's heart as he saw that hurt in Eve's eyes? As he saw the, the disappointment in her eyes? Can you imagine the, the, the loss of self-respect that he felt when he saw the shock and the pain, the disappointment, the hurt in her face? Because of sin, because of their changed nature, because of their sinful actions, that their, their now sinful nature produced, their perfect relationship was irreparably damaged. It was broken. It died. That relationship which would be marked by, by perfect openness and, and oneness and transparency and, and trust and love, it was now spoiled by suspicion, by mistrust, by argument and animosity. And the relationship, we see their, their relationship damaged even further by the punishment that God pronounces on them in verse 15. God says to Eve, she says, Eve, your desire shall be for your husband, but he shall rule over you. Now, when God says of Adam, he shall rule over you, he's saying because of his sinful nature, the husband's rule, it won't be the loving rule it's designed to be. It will be overbearing. It will be oppressive. It will be dictatorial. It'll be tyrannical. When he says, Eve's desire shall be for your husband, another way of translating is that is, your desire shall be against your husband. He's saying, because of your sinful nature, your desire will be to rule over your husband, to usurp his authority, to compete with him, to challenge him. Husbands will terrorize rather than treasure their wives. Wives will compete rather than complete their husbands. Their relationship was ruined. Gone is the loving leader and replaced with the overbearing bully that we so often are as husbands. Isn't that right? Gone is the supporter to be replaced with a contender. It so often characterizes so much of our interactions as husbands and wives. Sin brought death to that loving relationship. And friends, sin destroyed not only the marriage relationship, but destroyed all relationships. It introduced friction and contention, hostility, disunity, disharmony in all their relationships. All the arguments and hostility in the world, whether it's between spouses, between siblings, the arguments our, our children had this morning before they came out to church or, or last night as they wrestled over the last suite in, in, in the, the box during the quiz, the, the arguments in families, the arguments between families, you know, one family against, against another, arguments and hostility between nations that we're seeing played out very clearly in, in our, our Brexit negotiations with our, our closest neighbours in, in Europe, nation against nation. The friction and outright hatred between people of different backgrounds and upbringings and beliefs, between people of different communities, different cultures, different colors, different creeds. Friends, all the contention in the world, the racism, the bigotry, the hostility, the discrimination, the sectarianism that is a hallmark of Northern Ireland, it's down to sin. It's down to sin. Sin destroyed the perfect relationships that God created man to enjoy. We live in a doggy dog world, don't we? We're told to climb over everybody we can to get our way. We live in a world where the mantra is the survival of the fittest. We live in a world of anger and arguments and assaults physical and verbal assaults. We live in a world of jealousy and contention and crime against humanity. 
Why? Because sin has destroyed the relationships we were created to enjoy. It's part of the death that God clearly warned Adam and Eve that experience if they sinned against him. And the world tells us that the answer is education. We need better education. We need a better environment in which to bring up our children. Better education, better nurturing, better housing, better nourishment, better, better feeding, better opportunities, better living standards. And then we'll get on well. Gone will be the hostility and rancor and crime. No friends. No. The problem is sin. The problem is our sinful nature. And the only solution to that is a changed nature. And the only one who can change our nature is Christ. The third component of the death that God laid down as a punishment for sin is in our relationship with others, contention with our companions. Death involves change in our character, cut off and cut off from our creator, contention with our companions. The fourth and final component of death that we see here, this punishment that God laid down for sin is in our relationship with creation. It's in our relationship with creation. The fourth aspect of death is a conflict with creation. Conflict with creation. In chapter 1, God gave Adam the whole of his creation to rule over, to, to enjoy, to care for, to look after. In chapter 2, he takes Adam and he places him and, and then Eve in a beautiful garden paradise. It's filled with, with a myriad of beautiful trees filled with, with sweet-tasting fruit for them to eat and enjoy. A garden paradise in which their every material need is provided for and met in full. Chapter 2, we see Adam interact with, with some of, of the, the rest of, of God's creatures in the world. The animals cooperating with Adam, coming to him to be named, and he names them. The Adam and Eve weren't only to enjoy creation, they were to work it as we, we saw uh, a number of studies ago. They were to manage creation. They were to care for it. And creation cooperated with them in their work. And their work was, was enjoyable. Their work was satisfying. Their work was fulfilling. There was a, no hindrance, no stress, no disappointment, no rancor in their work at all. But here in chapter 3, as a result of Adam and Eve's sin, creation is affected. Man's relationship with creation is affected. In verses 14 to 19, some of those verses we read uh, a little bit earlier, God punishes the whole of creation. He places it under a curse. The creatures, firstly, they're cursed. The serpent more than the others, but all creatures are cursed. They too will die. They will have a fear of man. There won't be that cooperating companionship between man and the, create, the, the creatures that there once was. The ground is cursed. Thistles and thorns and weeds begin to appear. Work is cursed. Verse 19, God says, by the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread. Verse 17, he says, in pain, you shall eat Work becomes a burden. It becomes difficult. It becomes stressful. It's no longer enjoyable. It's no longer satisfying and, and pleasurable. It becomes hard. It becomes difficult. It becomes painful. It starts to involve sweat, blood, and tears for man. The creatures and creation that man was to exercise dominion over uh, and to co and cooperate with man in the exercise of his dominion it now kicks back against mankind, starts to oppose mankind. The creation that was so delightful to man now becomes a danger, a threat to mankind. Creation that was designed to nurture and provide for and, and care for mankind, it now becomes a killer. Work that was once satisfying is now stressful. The work that was once enjoyable, well, it's now... Something to, to endure. It's exhausting. Man's attitude of careful dominion is now an attitude of careless destruction. 
Sin brought death to creation. It brought conflict into our relationship, killed off our relationship with creation. And we see very clearly the outworking of this today. You know, killer whales and, and dangerous dogs, midges and mosquitoes, one of the effects of, of this part of death. Nettles, deadly nightshade, stings and snake venom, deadly viruses. Ever heard of one of those? Harmful bacteria, man polluting the environment and destroying ecosystems, work-related stress that we're hearing more and more of, unhappiness in the workplace, Monday morning blues. Tonight as you go to bed and you set your alarm clock for tomorrow morning and just that despondency, as you, you set your alarm clock for the school bus tomorrow or for work tomorrow, it's a result of the fall. It's an aspect of death. It's all part of our conflict with creation, the curse of creation. It's part of the death that God warned Adam and Eve that the world would experience if they sinned. Friends, that's death in all its terrible fullness, the death that God warned Adam and Eve that experience if they were foolish enough to disobey. And yes, it includes physical death. That tearing apart of man, the separation of, of body and soul, the severance of, of man from life into death. Yes, it includes physical death. But it includes so much more. Physical death that, you know, we, we focus on it, we fix our eyes on it, we fixate on it, and we see it as the most terrible part of, of God's punishment of, of sin. It, it's not. It isn't the only aspect of death that we experience because of sin, and, and it isn't even the worst aspect of death. Death involves the separating, the rupturing of our relationship in ourselves, our relationship with God, our relationships with others, and our relationship with creation. It involves a change in our character, being cut off from our creator, both here and now in this world, and eternally in the afterlife and hell, it involves contention with our companions and conflict with creation. That's death. The consequence of Adam and Eve's sin, the death, friends, that we are all dying. We are all experiencing that at this very moment, the death that we face because of sin. The death we deserve because of sin. The end. Wouldn't it be awful if it really was the end of the story of God's interaction with mankind, wouldn't it? If that's where the Bible ended. The death of humanity, the terror and the horror of this death. And yet, friends, wonderfully, it isn't. It isn't the end. Because the God whom we rebelled against and we brought this death upon ourselves by rebelling against, the God we rejected, choosing death instead of life with him in his love and in his mercy towards mankind, God has given us the promise. God has given us the possibility of life. He has sent his Savior, his own Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, into this world to reverse all these terrible effects and aspects of death, to reverse the death that we died in our nature, to remove the guilt, to take away the shame, the fear, and restore our inner peace, restore uh, 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 our perfect nature, to reverse the death that we died in our relationship with God, to deal with that sin that, that causes our fear and our animosity and hatred towards God, to free us from the wrath of God, restore the relationship with God we were created to enjoy. A savior to reverse the death that we died in our, in our relationship with others, to give us a nature that is free from hatred and animosity and jealousy and resentment. A nature that instead is filled with love for our brothers and sisters, enabling us to forgive our brothers and sisters and live in true peace and harmony with our fellow man. A savior who reverses the death that we died in our, in our relationship with creation. 
He says that whenever he returns one day at the end of time to, to, to reunite what was separated by death, reuniting our souls with, with resurrected bodies to live in a recreated heaven and earth, a perfect, sinless heaven and earth in which we will in, in, enjoy a perfect, sinless relationship with ourselves, with others, with creation, and with God. That perfect relationship we were created to find all our satisfaction, all our fulfillment in. Life. And friends, whether you experience the reversal of all these consequences of sin, the reversal of all these aspects of death, it depends on how you respond to the Savior. It depends on how you respond to Jesus. And if you reject him, and if you try to, to cover up your own shame like Adam and Eve did in the garden, if you continue to run from him in fear and animosity like Adam and Eve did in the garden, the day will come when you will find, just like Adam and Eve did in the garden, that you cannot run from God. You cannot hide from God. And you'll stand before him and he'll condemn you to hell. Eternal banishment, separation from God and everything good enduring the punishment that you deserve, justly deserve for your sins. An agonizing eternal death. But if instead of running from him, you run to him, instead of hiding from him, you open up to him as, as he calls you to in repentance and faith. You open up your heart to him. Instead of death, God promises you life resurrected, restored, reunited in a recreated world without death and suffering, where that question will never be asked whatever again. Why is there death and suffering in the world? Because it's a world we're told about in Revelation 21 and verse 4, where we read, he will wipe away every tear from their eyes. And death, every aspect of it, shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore. For the former things have passed away. And for those of you who have lost loved ones in the recent past, for those of you who continue to, to mourn the passing of, of loved ones, Many, many, many years ago, loved ones who have died having put their faith in Christ. Let this be your comfort today. Let this be your comfort. Because that's what our loved ones who have died in Christ are experiencing even now. In the presence of God, complete absence of death and all aspects of death. Life through faith in Christ. And the question for us today who remain, the question for all of you who are listening is, what's it going to be for you? What's it going to be for you? Death in every aspect or life through faith in Christ? Amen.